Welcome to another edition of your favorite program, The Dream Big Series. As you already know, The Dream Big Series is a conversation between Ghanaian children and key personalities who have achieved success from their chosen fields. I am Teofilos Okru and I'm your presenter. Our guest for this week is Mr. Kwame Pieni. I will not call him Mr. Kwame Pieni, rather I will call him Grandpa. He's a development economist. So let's go and see Grandpa. We are very grateful that you agreed to have a conversation with us. It's my pleasure to talk to you. Please tell us what drives you. At my age now, what drives me is how to make sure that Ghana develops in such a way that everybody participates, what they call inclusive, so that everybody in Ghana progresses more or less along the same lines. So that when you have something, I'm not jealous of you, because I know I have an opportunity to make the same, so that there is harmony in our society. You were born in Kumasi. Who are your parents? My father was a uh, Kwabna Nyameche, and then his father's name was Pianim. So when he went to school, he was called James uh, Pianim, and he was a mechanic, uh, what we call a fitter. <laughs> My mother uh, was a trader. She was trading in clothes in the Kumasi market. So those were my mother never went to school, but my father did go to school. You were brought up by your grandmother. Please tell us why. You know, in those days, uh, when you are a young woman, you are living in Kumasi with your husband, going to the market and trading and coming back home. So my mother, as was typical among a lot of the women, would go and give their child to their mother, that's my grandmother, uh, to look after me because I was too troublesome in the market. I was getting lost, I was getting into fights. So they took me to stay with my grandmother. Grandpa, what are the books you read and why? I like The Little Prince. Uh, and then I also liked some of the Anansi stories. Uh, I like reading them because Anansi is a bit of a, a rogue, you know, what in English they call anti-hero. He's not really the hero. He's a rascal who brings to light uh, the character of Intikuma the son, who is a real hero, because the moral story is always Anansi playing tricks, and then Intikuma the son trying to tell him that you are not doing right, you know. So I like that he showed you what you shouldn't do and what you should try to do. Who and where did you find inspiration? I guess there are times these days when I wake up in the morning and I feel like pulling the cloth over my head and going back to sleep. Because things look so desperate sometimes. But I'm an, a born optimist. And I think if you are born in a developing country like Ghana, you have to be an optimist that there's always something better. Remember, when I was a teenager, that was when we got independence, 1957. And to us, the sky was the limit. Ghana would become a developer the UK. We, we, there was nothing that was challenging for us. We thought we could achieve anything in the world that we set our minds to. So that has made me very, very optimistic. So I, there's always hope. I see the glass as always half full, not half empty. What does working as a development economist mean to you? Those of us who are born in countries such as Ghana, we say we are a developing country. And the economics just means how to keep house. It's like uh, a housewife. You get money, you spend it to make your family happy. So for a country, you take taxes, you borrow money, and you try to make the country uh, there's the money that you get and then you spend it on the people to make them happy. And the difference between a developing uh, economist and a matured one is that with us, a developing country, you have to invest for the country to grow. You have to invest in education because if you don't teach your young people 
nation building skills, being electrician, plumber, engineers, then you are not going to grow. Uh, you have to invest in uh, your waters for hydro, you have to invest in electricity, you have to invest in your roads, your ports and harbors uh, for the country to grow. In the developed countries like UK and America, what drives the economy is consumption. So when the economy is getting weak, they get people to spend more, to go to the stores and spend. Here, we have to invest to grow. That's basically the difference. Who has influenced you the most? Probably most of them are all women. My grandmother, uh, because she taught me to have self-confidence, to believe in myself, you know. And uh, when I was young, you know, and sat for the common entrance to come to our mother school, she told my uncle, use the revenue from my cocoa farms to educate him. So I owe a lot to my grandma. And my mother, uh, very loving, where 10 of us in the, in the family, she had 10 children, but she loved all of us almost equally. And the funny thing is that all of us think we are our mother's favorite. And to me, it taught me that when you have children, you love all of them unconditionally because you find something good, different, but good in each one of them. And the two of them have been very inspiring. And then uh, for to succeed, you know, you need to be consistent and have commitment. And my wife Cornelia, you know, has been very good. I mean, when I was in jail for 10 years, she could have run away to her home country. She stayed and supported me, you know. So uh, the main influences on me have all invariably been uh, women who were very influential the way I was brought up, the way I was educated, and also the way I've been protected to continue living. Please, what achievement are you most proud of? What I'm most proud of? I think uh, if I walk around Ghana and I see some of the projects I was involved in, it makes me very proud. Like when I'm driving on Independence Avenue and I see NAT, uh, the Ghana National Association of Teachers, we helped at New World build up the teachers fund. You know, went to the teachers and said, look, you cannot say you are poor. You are 250,000 of you. If each one of you put aside one uh, city or 10 cities a month, that's uh, 2.5 million a month and you can grow. You know, it's from the Susu system that I learned from my mother. You know, she and five of her friends, every month, each one of them will put in those one pound in the middle and one of them will take it as capital to capitalize themselves. And in those days, if you have 10 pounds, you can go to Unilever, UAC, JB Oliver, and you become a wholesale uh, dealer. And that capitalizes them. And then you, you can, they will even give you goods on credit. So they use that to capitalize themselves. And that's the same system I picked from my mother and used it for the, uh, for the teacher's fund. You know? So I see that I'm very proud. When I'm going around and I see the French hotel in town, uh, I'm very proud because Mr. Kofi Annan and I, when he was managing director of uh, the tourist development company, we put it together, the project outline, and then put the investors uh, together uh, to be able to do that. And uh, Spin Test Road, you know, I helped the company to do the spinning engineering on that uh, place. There was no uh, no activity was going on there. So when we put on spin test factory, everybody who was driving there started using spin test road, spin test road became spin test road. But that was a millet family whom I helped to develop that factory. So when you are, um, you are part of something and you are going around and you see you are very proud. When I was a Minister of Finance, we helped to set up SNET, the Social Security and National Insurance Trust. So now when I see grown to become the backbone for workers' retirement benefits. I feel very proud. As a child, what did you dream of and how did those dreams lead you here? It's funny. Uh, myself and a very close friend of mine, Mr. Benton Williams, who was the managing director of Sea Gold Mines, became my ambassador to Malaysia and to India. You know, where my mother used to stay in Fantino town, Pompata, 
uh, it was in Kumasi. It was below the Premier Assembly Hall. So when any DC was coming, uh, all that they were doing is that you have the dispatch riders. They were driving around there, go boom, 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 and for a young man, this was heaven, you know, to be on this machine to go there. That was one of the things I wanted to do. But as I grew older, I wanted to become a lawyer, to be able to defend people in court. And then I changed my mind later on that may be helping countries to develop, to take the resources that have been given to the human beings, the forest, the timber, the mines, the people, and combining them to create progress, livelihood, so that the young people can stay in the country, work here, and prosper here. Instead of sometimes our people running away to go to Europe as if uh, that's the best place to live. You know, I want Ghanaians to be able to live here, work here, and prosper here so that we are all happy instead of going to places where they are not even welcome. You had a Commonwealth scholarship to go study at Canada by studying the history of fishing, but you changed your mind in Canada and studied development economics. Why? I was given a scholarship and the whole idea was that I'll go and learn history and come back to Legon and lecture. You know, and I like history too because history teaches us where we've come from. They say if you don't know where you've come from and you don't know where you are going, you can't ask somebody for directions. You need to know where you are. But when I got to Canada, I was supposed to start in universities four years. And I said, no, if I had gone to the UK, I could have gone to Cambridge or Oxford because it was a Commonwealth scholarship. That's where we used to go. This was the first time Canada was doing it. So I said, no. I will take three years. They said, no, four years. I said, no. Then I'm going back home. They said, okay, you can do three years. And when I look at the courses there, it was the history of fishing in Canada. I said, no, 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 I don't want that. So I started doing uh, philosophy, economics, and politics. And that's how uh, I changed. You know, I, I didn't want to do fishing history in uh, Canada. And they said that after the first year, they would do, me a, they would do a test. And if I pass, then I can continue. I don't have to go to the first year. So I started in the second year. And at the end of it, there was nothing I continued. So I did three years. And that's when I decided to do as my first degree, uh, economics and political science. You are a strong advocate for women's rights. Please, why do you think it's important? It's very important for every country to appreciate and honor is women. In Ghana, more than half the population is made up of women. And uh, if you're a boxer, you are going to fight. You don't tie your hand, one hand behind your back. You fight with both of them. And uh, there are a lot of characteristics where women complement men. It's therefore important that you make sure that you give equal access to all the children that we have, men and women, uh, so that uh, they also uh, have equal access to all the opportunities in life. You know, I've told my grandmother, my mother, and the people who inspired me are invariably all women. And I'm also an Akan. And in the Akan culture, matrilineal society, the women are very important. You cannot become a chief if the women uh, do not uh, vote for you. And my first child was a girl, uh, my daughter. And uh, when she wanted to do medicine, I said, will you do pediatrics? She said, no, I want to be a surgeon. And that's what she is. And countries in this world that suppress their women, in the 21st century, they are not going to progress. The countries that progress are the countries where all your 25, 26 million citizens, hands on deck, help to develop uh, the country. If you take farming, most of it is the women. You go to the fisher folks in the, at the beach, the women are the ones who manage the catch, sell it, the women go and bring it. So you need the complementarity. If you are at the board level, if you are running a company on the board, you have women on it, you'll be amazed what men will normally lose. That women will bring on board, you know, sensitivity for people's feelings, sensitivity for what the market may want and what the market may not want. Remember, it's women who spend a lot of our money. And therefore, it's important that you have 
people who think like them also at the board level. Describe in one brief sentence how you imagine a better world for children. A world that is good for children is where every child has somebody who loves them unconditionally. Somebody who protects them. Somebody who makes sure that they are fed. And a government that makes sure that they have equal opportunity like everybody else to develop their God-given talents. That they should be free to decide what they want to become in the world. And a world where children are free to play, go out, play and be able to come home without the parents feeling there may be something uh, happening to them. I want a world of harmony, where children respect each other, where children do not just tolerate people from other races, from other tribes, but celebrate the fact that we are different. Because you know our kente cloth, you have different colors, different colors. When you see the different colors together, that's when you have beauty. And it's when you and all your friends, boys and girls, from all the tribes in Ghana, work together, playing together. That's when I see the type of world that I want children to be, a world of harmony, a world of racial equality, and not just tolerating, but really rejoicing in our differences, because there are differences that attract us to one another, and that was makes us great. Could you please tell us a story that has made an impact on you? I'll tell you an Anansi story. One day, at the beginning of the world, Kwekwe Anansi is a bit of a rascal, it's a spider, and he decided that people were too smart in the world, so he wanted to monopolize all the wisdom. So he went around the world and collected all the brains from everybody and put it in the pot. And I was going to climb a coconut tree and put the pot on top of the coconut tree so that he would be the only smart person in the world. But as he was climbing, you know, he had put the pot in front of his stomach. So of course he can't climb the tree with that. And his son, Ntikuma, was standing there. So as he was trying to go, he said, Daddy, wouldn't it be better if you had a pot on your back so that you can scale up the palm tree? And Anansi was furious. He meant that he had not succeeded in collecting all the wisdom in the world. So he threw the pot down. He broke. And that's why all the people in the world, we all have some wisdom. It was because Anansi wanted to have, but he lost some from the sun. You know why I like the story? Everywhere in the world, you are working in a company, you are playing soccer, you are doing anything in the world. It's teamwork. If people work together as a team, then there's progress. If you try to work only by yourself, you can't work. Look at my fingers. You know, together. They are not the same, but together they can do it. If I tie this one up, I can do it. Uh, so I like the Anansi story about Kwekwe Anansi trying to steal all the wisdom and it's failing, and that's why you and I are so smart. Thank you very much, Grandpa. Please, we'd like to hear one last story from you before we sign off. Hmm, you want another story? You are a story mom guy. Okay, I'll tell the story about the turtle and the rabbit. That's from Aesop stories, the Aesop fables. Uh, one of my favorite readings when I was a child. Uh, the rabbit went to the turtle and said, we are going to have a race. And the rabbit says, foolish, you can't race with me. I'm very fast. You can't even walk properly. He said, let's bet. The boastful uh, turtle said, yes, okay, let's go. You are on. They started like from here, airport residential area to uh, the airport uh, proper. The rabbit took off very quickly and looked behind his back, couldn't see any turtle. So he 
sat down to try to have a nap before he continued because he knew the turtle is not coming uh, any shortly. Anyway, after his nap, he took off, ran very quickly. By the, the time he got to the end, there was the turtle sitting there waiting for him. My friend, how did you do it? He said, I beat you in the race. You were just boosting. And uh, the moral of that story is that boosting is not good. If you are very good, let others uh, praise you. And also, just doing things in spares is not good enough. In life, to succeed, you need commitment to a purpose. You need consistency. And what the turtle had done, what he had planned, he had strategized. He has positioned his team of relatives along the road and that's also teamwork. So that by the time the rabbit got to the end there, one of the relatives, and the rabbit can't tell one uh, turtle from the other, was there. So to me, I like that story. It shows teamwork. If you are playing soccer, you are in a company, whatever you do in this world, if you have a team, and you rely on one another with different skill sets together, you succeed. And also, humility is important. We thank you very much for agreeing to have a conversation with us. Thank you very much, Theo. It was a pleasure thank talking you. to you. Okay. Well, friends, I hope you enjoyed the conversation you had with Grandpa. Until we come your way same time next week, don't forget, the program is Dream Big Series. So let's go and dream big. Bye.